Revisiting Miyako Kawakami's work two years after reading Breasts and Eggs was like meeting an old friend who you haven't seen in years. At first you weren't even sure that you wanted to talk, that you wanted to meet up, but by chance, just by sheer luck, you were in the same place at the same time and you decided to give it a chance and here we are and suddenly you find yourself settling into an old rhythm, almost as if you never parted. You jump easily back into conversation and it's lyrical and poetic and intimate and it's everything you ever wanted and it just feels right. You talk as if the distance between you both never existed. You talk as if you're still the same people that you were years ago. You talk as if there weren't millions of life-changing events that occurred in the space since you last saw each other. You truly revive a piece of the old you in a sentimental conversation that makes you say, Miyako, why have we ever even parted? <laughs> Heaven felt exactly right in that way, with its heart-wrenching moments of tenderness, non-physical intimacy, its simple but direct writing style that guides you with an elegant but sure hand and yet lets you wallow in emotion and philosophical consideration. In short, meeting an old friend again is great. Except when it gets to those awkward moments when you've exhausted the old I miss you and when you're not quite sure what to say next and when you hug and you don't know for how long to hug someone and it just feels uncomfortable. <laughs> and likewise, the beauty of Miyako Kawakami's writing is juxtaposed by the brutal topic that it explores. I am absolutely here for the carrot and stick treatment because Miyako Kawakami presents us with this absolutely lovely tale of two lost souls finding support in each other and finding strength and she really puts a smile on your face to see two people bond just to absolutely rip it off tear that smile into pieces with tales of kids bullying each other to the point of abuse the result is an incredibly poignant tale the perfect space to feel and the perfect space to think it's not quite a little life with its 700 pages of characterization, but it doesn't need to be. It's the perfect mix of being present and looking into the future and looking into the past. And it really allows you to consider how far you've come along in your life and to think, what if I was in that situation? What would I be doing? Kawakami is truly unrelenting and unyielding in her persistence to illuminate the issues that plague many young people and many people even in their adulthood today. Bullying. Beneath the lovely writing and that heartwarming, blossoming tale of friendship I talked about lies the uncomfortable aspect, this voyeuristic aspect of us as the reader being forced to witness a 14-year-old shoved, kicked, pushed, and there's nothing we can do. We were almost forced to sit there and wait for the next occasion of bullying. He's subjected to suffering day after day, hour after hour, finding himself helpless, unsure of what to do, and we're right there with him, and yet we find ourselves waiting for those occasions. Of course, hoping that they won't happen, but waiting for them, because Miyako Kamakami's writing lures you in, and it has that deep undercurrent of something darker that forces us to read on, even when the content is like this. And as a teenager, your life very much revolves around school. You go to school during the day, well, for him, you face just hours of unrelenting hell and beating, and then you go back home just to hide from your parents and not talk about what you're experiencing and deal with it by yourself, being forced to think, why am I the one being bullied? I prefer to be the one being I prefer to be the bully, essentially, rather than face this on a day-to-day -day basis. Thinking, what makes me different from the others and why is my difference a cause of separation and alienation? Why am I forced to experience this when, for millions of other people, school is just a place of joy and a place to, to, a place to gain an education rather than to experience all the suffering? Heaven surprised me in many ways. I had this previous idea of Miyako Kawakami's writing as this direct, beautiful, smooth-flowing exploration of things like gender inequality and persistence and courage and resilience because the women in breasts and eggs were so fierce and so dedicated to survival that they did whatever they needed to do and it was just truly a story of dedication and I partly got that with the beautiful writing and I partly got the saddest story I've read in months and it's not a bad thing but that permeating discomfort that you feel from watching the bullying, 
I think it's really and truly aggravated and you could feel it a lot more if you read Miyako Kawakami's other work because it's just not what you expect and is it bad for me to say that I enjoyed it when this, the content of this book is like this? Kojima, a girl from a dysfunctional family and the nameless narrator that the bullies call Eyes are presented to us as outsiders. Kojima is separated because she wants to feel closer to her impoverished father. She stops washing herself in order to feel like his skin is her skin. And our nameless narrator Eyes has a lazy eye and this is why the other kids continuously beat him and abuse him. And he tries to just accept it and to avoid it and to move on counting the days until high school is over and he can move on. But Kojima is different. He finds strength by reading her letters and communicating with her and feeling as if he isn't the only one in his plight. Kojima not only writes those letters and gives him strength, in fact, she seems to embrace the suffering, believing that it's necessary in a broader, longer quest that will be rewarded later on. She acts with what she calls the strengths of weakness, believing that everything will be justified and that moral standards are the most important thing that we have to hold. For her, heaven is a painting that she calls heaven herself, where it shows a very mundane situation with two lovers sitting together at a picnic, and no matter how many objects are between them, they can just stretch their neck further and join each other and overcome their problems together and find happiness. And this is what heaven means for her. Heaven means suffering so that you get to a place where your suffering is recognized and those who hurt you, they're punished. Ultimately, our narrator admires and tries to follow Kojima, not only because she is his only friend, but because he genuinely thinks that there is something to be admired in her behavior and in her strength and resilience. After a particularly brutal bullying incident that left my face hurting just from reading about it, the narrator cannot sleep and he can barely comprehend the world around him. And what's more symbolical than feeling lost in a world? feeling as if you don't know what your purpose, what your meaning is, just blindly following other people along and, well, just trying not to die and trying to live on for a few minutes more. And it's in this situation that he finds strength and support from Kojima. She is the only thing keeping him alive. She's like a beacon of hope in this situation. And I feel like she is his religion in a way because religion can often be something that people turn to exactly to avoid feeling helpless and alone and avoid seeking as if you're not in control of your own life in this scary and frankly frightening world. And he tries to follow her, but he's unable to just accept the suffering as she does. She turns the other cheek and she smiles and he can barely turn his head and he's trying to hold in his tears. And I think there's more to say about this that he rejects her own beliefs in a way and tries to find his own teachings and his own purpose of life. Other characters in this story go the other extreme. If Kojima is intent on punishing herself and allowing for this suffering to continue, even though she's powerful enough to stop it, others decide to see that there is no meaning in life and that there is no point to suffering, so instead they seek pleasure. If there is no meaning in life, nihilism and there's no purpose at all, maybe we can make our own purpose and our own pleasure and do things just because we can. It's eat or be eaten and the bullies or a particular bystander who lets his friends bully the main characters, he chooses that path but instead of just eating other people, he utterly d devours them and crushes them and when the narrator confronts him about it, his explanation is I do it just because I can. I don't bully you because you're different. I don't bully you because I'm insecure. I bully you because you were just there when I felt that way and I can. And I admire Miyako Kawakami for stopping this age-long trope in bullying books to just say, oh, the bully's insecure. Instead, she portrays her bullies as being something else. And yes, you can argue that it's perhaps overly philosophical for a 14 year old who hasn't spoken for the entire book and what are these deep themes of nihilism and religion pursuing in the middle of a book about a 14 year old coming of age story but I think it's just a very unique take on this 
And it definitely shows that Heaven is not another bullying book. I mean, yes, it's about, uh, it's about bullying, but it's not just another book about bullying. It's something truly unique and special that I think you should check out. And so we have a beautiful philosophical discussion about the nature of strength and weakness and how it relates to good and bad and how people view life and our purpose in it as we age and progress through this world. We have the bully who does the bullying just because. We have the girl who suffers because she thinks she should suffer. And we have the confused narrator torn between both sides of the extreme and thinking about what he should do in this frightening situation. What I love most is that even if Kawakami has a belief, and I think you can find her belief in the story if you look deeper, she doesn't necessarily push it down your throat. She truly allows you to find the space and the time to think for yourself and to come to your own conclusions about this work. And in such a claustrophobic story, having the space to breathe is truly different. Ultimately, we don't get to see heaven, the painting that the book centers around. But for me, the ending feels very much like a resolution. And I want to keep this review spoiler free and to give you that space and that time to come to a conclusion about what you think for yourself, just like Miyako Kawakami allows us to do that, just that. But I do want to say that for me, the ending is all about finding beauty in the world around you and finding strength and finding admiration from simple things. And you don't necessarily have to turn to the extreme like suffering and you don't have to turn to nihilism if instead you can just find joy for yourself and find things that make you happy and find solutions that work for you, that heal you and that improve you as a person, I think that's ultimately the steps towards ending suffering, even if it doesn't seem like that in the book. But that's just my take on it. So while heaven has its issues in terms of things like plot progression, I feel like sometimes it was just too much to throw on a 14 year old and it kind of lost the smooth flowing atmosphere that we had building throughout the entire novel and and at times I felt like the bully the main bully never really got the space and the attention for him as a character so it just felt a little unrealistic that we have this main the main focus be a guy who doesn't really do anything the entire novel I still think that heaven is absolutely worthwhile of your time and I hope you enjoyed this mini spoiler-free review and it made you understand if this is something that you want on your shelf or if this is something that you'd prefer avoiding. It's been a while since I've done a review, so please do leave a comment and a like. It really means a lot because I have been doing this mostly on Instagram. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.